the, uh, we left off in class looking at this um, cross section of intestinal wall. We looked at, you got the longitudinal circular muscle and you got two layers of mucosa. Remember, mucosa it sounds like mucus. That's that layer where you're gonna have the absorption of all the nutrients coming into the uh, into uh, your bloodstream, you know, through your small intestine. And just in case, it might ask you to do a magnification or a calculation of a magnification. So I want to show you how they might they might do that. So it shows you up here, it's a hundred x. So remember. The equation for magnification is magnification equals the measured size over the real size. So if you took a ruler and say it asks you what's the actual uh, width of the uh, um, of the circular and longitudinal muscles, Let's see at the example I did there. Or say the say the question was the the thickness of the submucosa, and say this sec at this spot here, it would be about 14 millimeters. So I put a 14 here. So 100 equals 14 over x, and then if you divide both sides by 100, um, you get the the value in millimeters of what the actual size is and then to convert it say it asks you in uh, microns you're going to move the decimal place over three times so one two three so if it asks you what the actual size or width of that sub mucosa here um, at this point right here you would write 140 microns but we almost we uh, we already identified those tissues, that outer layer. That's the long, longitudinal muscle. The layer right below it is circular. And the next question is asking about this motor uh, or a neurotransmitter actually called acetylcholine. And what is the effect? It's used to activate skeletal muscles. What's the effect of these pesticides on insect synapses? Um, all the pesticide or pesticides that that we tr that we use um, for our crops, we're basically trying to mess up the insect's physiology. So um, they die, and our crops survive. So what it does, it binds. Uh, it binds to the receptors for, for acetylcholine, prevents the acetylcholine from uh, firing that muscle, and because the insect can't use the muscle, um, it gets paralyzed and it dies, you know, blocks that signal. And I drew, there's a diagram right here. So the motor neuron, here's the uh, receptor, and the pesticide comes in here and it blocks the acetylcholine from uh, binding with that receptor and then allowing that insect to breathe. One of the ways that pesticides kill off insects. And resistance to pesticides and all pesticides has been seen. So how does that happen? So here, when, you, when we're looking at resistance First thing you should think about is natural selection, okay? And what we see, there's so much variation in living things. There's mutations that give some individuals the ability to resist, you know, certain certain chemicals. And there must have been a, a mutation to give some sort of resistance uh, to these. Uh, resistance to these insects against this certain type of, uh, of pesticides and perhaps that mutation helps to break down the pesticide maybe their receptor is shaped differently and it doesn't accept the neonicotinoid um, as you know it doesn't block it 
receptor shape differently. And when it comes to natural selection, that's how this process occurs. The individuals with that resistant gene survive and reproduce. They pass on that gene to their offspring. And then those offspring tend to have that new gene and that makes them more resistant. So now the population, instead of being maybe 10% resistant, maybe now it's 50% resistant. And if that, if that drug, if that pesticide keeps being used, maybe eventually it'll get to be like 75 to like 90% resistant. Just depends on how long those different pesticides are used. Normally they'll try to use different ones to, uh, to avoid that. And since we're on natural selection, we want to think about these core ideas. There's variation, differential reproduction, meaning not everybody has the same number of offspring. Traits are heritable. If you couldn't pass on these genes and these traits, then natural selection wouldn't occur. Resources are limited, so not everybody survives. So only the ones that are best adapted tend to survive, reproduce, pass on their genes. Too many babies, okay? Um, yeah, I just explained that. Are limited resources, yeah. Uh, they have to struggle for those resources because you have too many mouths to feed. Adaptations, traits, um, the physical characteristics we see help survival. Uh, descent with modification, gradual change over time. New species can arise if we see like a mountain, um, a mountain range pop up between two, two populations they'll start uh, stop breeding with each other and then you can have two new populations and then extinction the species is gone and if you think of the uh, these are all from that activity we did with dogs a while back where we related natural selection to dogs so think about the dog activity And also think about the peppered moss. Remember the peppered moss in England, how the environment changed through pollution, and therefore um, they had to get darker, but then the environment got better. It got less polluted, so they had to get lighter again. And Darwin's finches in the Galapagos, those beaks changing as uh, the, those finches went to different islands and encounter different food sources. All right, another question relating to evolution here. Here we have a cladogram showing the relationships, the evolutionary relationships between different organisms. fish, bird, and mammal. So to help you out, just think about the characteristics of birds, fishes, and mammals. So, uh, you know, fishes, you know, have gills, scales, birds have feathers, um, and then mammals, we have uh, hair on our bodies, which the other two don't. So one diagnostic feature that characterizes these groups. So once you branch off and go towards A, all these organisms are going to have gills, scales, fins, uh, and external fertilization. If we go to B, once we go off in birds and mammals, we're looking at birds and mammals, they're endothermic. You know, they maintain their, their body temperature. We call it warm blooded a lot. Um, I think that's a homeostasis here. That's part of the endothermic, warm-blooded. Um, they both have lungs. And here we have internal fertilization. Uh, inside the body of the female, we'll see the fertilization of the egg. And then now we're we separated, we branched off from birds and mammals. And 
is specifically to mammals. We've got the hair on the body and then mammary glands. So those are just, remember you just need one, it's three points. So one of those things to answer those questions. There we go. So from a gene pool, how populations could evolve into different groups. So there's a bunch of different mechanisms. This is in the topic 10 videos. Uh, geographic isolation. You have a, a mountain range or a, an ocean or a river, big huge rock that comes up, which is a mountain range, that blocks them from uh, getting, uh, blocks the individuals from traveling and then mating with each other. Um, okay, I was trying to read my writing. I think what I have here is migration. So if you, if the, uh, the population, you know, migrates further away, it could get cut off potentially by say, I have here an ice sheet. That's another type of, uh, these are all types of geographic isolation. But over here is different. This is temporal. And temporal isolation is when they mate at different times of the year. So they, one group starts to mate in February, the other one mates in March. They're not gonna be exchanging genes anymore because they can't, they don't mate at the same time. And then this last one you need to know is behavioral. So, their behaviors for mating are just too different. Their, uh, just their traditions, not their traditions, but um, like just how they move their body and how they, like birds have a lot of dances they do. Some birds anyway, dances of different feathers they'll uh, present to the female to get that female to mate. So the female is not recognizing that dance or that behavior, she's not gonna want to mate. So what happens is um, the groups do not interbreed. Mutations are contained with, um, within the group. Groups do not interbreed. Clean that up. Mutations are contained in one group. group and then of course different environments are going to create different selective pressures so pressuring for uh, more fur less fur darker fur lighter fur whatever that may be a different hunting strategy that's going to affect the organism and what they end up you know, looking like and the allele frequency change so the uh, the amounts of different genes change And that's something that can be measured. Scientists can look and test for different alleles and see if those alleles are any different in uh, frequency. Now, last question of part A. Okay, so mitochondria evolved from prokaryotic cells. Um, that's the endosymbiotic theory. Two adaptations that help relate that relate to its function. One is the cristae, you know, those those finger-like projections in the mitochondria. This is the mitochondria. These are the cristae, all these little bumps. And that really increases surface area and it makes it more efficient. Um, more efficient. And there's a gap between the inner and outer membranes where hydrogen can accumulate the intermembrane space. And 
this ATP synthase enzyme that it has um, it, it has adapted over time, helps to, helps to make ATP or greatly, it doesn't by itself make it, but it's that last final step. And it also has you know ribosomes and DNA to make the enzymes, the proteins that are used in that electron transport chain. So it's basically like a cell within a cell. And I guess the last thing I did have, maybe might as well just review our different phyla that you need to know about. For plants, you got the bryophytes, which are mosses and liverworts, phyllocinophyta, which are ferns, coniferophyta, which are uh, pine trees, anything with a cone on it, and then angiospermophyta, and that's flowering plants. Here I put the kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species for a couple, for a couple different things. Humans, we're both in cats, we're both animals, we're both chordates, we're both, both mammals, but now we're getting different in our orders. We are primates, order primate, and cats are carnivora, and we are hominidae. Cats are Felidae. We are in the genus Homo. And cats are in the genus Felis. And we are sapiens, our species, species Homo sapiens. And there are uh, house cat is in the Catus species. And here are the animal phyla that you need to be aware of. Poriferans, the sponges, or periphera. Cnidaria, jellyfish. Cnidaria, jellyfish. Um, sea anemones. Coral. Platyhelminthes. Um, flatworms, tapeworms, mollusca. Sponges, squid, octopus, annelida, leeches, earthworms. And arthropoda, insects, crustaceans like crabs and lobsters. Alright, so that finishes section A.